Amen. Good morning, Hope Church. Happy Labor Day weekend. Hope everybody's having a good weekend, and uh, you're stuck with me this morning. So uh, if you thought Pastor Daniel was preaching, I apologize in advance. Uh, I just want to welcome everybody watching online. Thank you for watching. I hope some of our uh, executive team are watching this. We honor you today and enjoy your day off with your family. We bless you, and uh, thank you for trusting us with your church. Amen. You know, uh, it really is an honor to serve here at Hope Church. I've been on staff for going on seven years now, and uh, Hope Church really is a place where they, we honor the presence of God, we value His Spirit, and above all else, we're really hungry to see God move, especially in the upstate and around our state. And uh, we've seen glimpses of revival, we've been uh, praying and seeking and expectant that God's going to do something really powerful in the upstate. How many of you guys have been praying for that? You just uh, believing God that you're going to see revival, you're going to see an outpouring in your lifetime, in your day. Come on. I, I believe I'm going to see it, I believe you're going to see it, I believe we're on the cusp of something really powerful. Um, but how many of you know, just because you show up on a Sunday morning doesn't mean you're going to see revival, right? Just because you show up to a football game doesn't mean you're, they're going to put you on the field to play. Come on. And I, I really believe that if we're going to see a move of God, if we're going to see something incredible happen in the upstate, in our church, in our region, it's first got to happen in us. But also we've got to position ourselves in the right spot for that to happen. And it just doesn't happen on accident. We see all these incredible moves of God. We see something sovereign like what happened at uh, Asbury University and uh, places like that where there's just a sovereign outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But how many of you know that there was this someone who had been praying? There was someone who was seeking. There was someone who was hungry to see that happen in that time probably for decades, if, if we're honest. If you, if you look back and you start asking around and you start uh, uncovering layers, there's always someone at the core of it who, who said, Lord, I'd give my life to see this happen. And so I believe there's something really powerful that we can do in our own lives to position ourselves to see God move. And so today, I just wanna talk about seeking God first. Is that okay? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for our church. Lord, thank you for what you're doing all over the earth. Lord, thank you for what you want to do here, Lord. And I just ask you that you would speak to us this morning, that you would move on our hearts today. Help us, Jesus, put you where you rightly belong, where you rightly deserve in our lives today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So with that positioning thing, I I started to learn how to surf last year. Have you guys ever tried surfing? Just nobody. We live in Green, Spartanburg, Greenville. Okay, a couple people. So like, uh, I get really bored when we go on vacation because my wife, bless her heart, she just likes to sit there <laughs> on the beach. Just like, babe, are you, are you awake? Are you breathing? And I get really bored, and so I try to find things on the beach because we like to go to the beach to, to, to occupy myself because I can't just, can't just say that. So uh, it, it escalated from early on when we were married, we'd go on these trips to Myrtle Beach or something, and I'd get a boogie board, and I'm like, okay, this is fun. Then it escalated last year into me renting a surfboard, and I learned very quickly that just because I was in the ocean and I had a surfboard didn't mean I was going to catch a wave. There's a lot of factors, okay? And so I just thought, hey, I'll do it. I do CrossFit. I can, I'm in shape, kind of. I can do this. And the ocean and water in general just has a really powerful way of humbling you very quickly. It's just like the Lord just hits you with literally a wave and just says, nope. And so I did that over and over and over and over and over and over and over again almost drowned, then I did it over and over again. And I finally was able to stand up on my surfboard, but I fully realized that it was less about me being on a surfboard and being on the water. It was more about me positioning myself in the right place to ride the wave. And so in the context of moving 
uh, in the spirit and, and following God, I truly believe that when we seek God first and put him in the, as the primary focus of our lives, it positions ourselves in a place for us to see revival. Okay, and so uh, I'm not at talking so much today about uh, a, a church service or an extended amount of church services as I am God mo us moving into a place, into alignment with him where he is the primary focus and we can come into alignment with that and he moves through us. But we've gotta be in the right place to do that. It's not gonna, not gonna happen on accident. It's not gonna happen, uh, we're just not gonna stumble into it. And so that's kind of where I'm at in my life, where I want to be as intentional as possible to see God move in my life and ultimately in our church and in our, in our city, because our city, our, our city needs revival. My generation needs revival. They need to see God move. They need an awakening. There's too many people dying and going to hell. There's too many people committing suicide. There's too many people who are depressed and lonely that need Jesus. They need a church family. So Matthew 6, verse 33 says, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. King David said it like this in Psalm 27, four. See, he said, the one thing I ask of the Lord, the thing I seek most is to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, delighting in the Lord's perfections and meditating in his temple. We've got to have him first. He's got to be that one thing. See, we live in a culture with so many options nowadays, right? We've got so many things. We have so many decisions. By the time we even get up, get dressed, get in the car and head to work, we've already made so many decisions. What am I gonna wear? What am I gonna eat? Am I gonna respond to that email early? Am I gonna respond to that text message, right? So many decisions. And if you have kids, that's exponentially multiplied, right? I don't know. I'm just guessing. But I have a dog and it's complicated. <laughs> and we kind of have so many, we have so many decisions that the choice to put God first kind of gets relegated into that list of other decisions, right? But can I tell you that decision is so much easier to make in light of who he is? and how we see him. See, it's not like going to pick a restaurant. You know, like, hey babe, what do you wanna go eat? I don't know, what do you want? F fellas, we've, been, we've had that conversation, right? And I'm like, just tell me, okay? I'm gonna pick the restaurant you hate until you tell me what you want. Okay, I'm putting it in the GPS, we're driving there, and I will wait in the parking lot till you tell me what you really want. Come on. Or ladies, is it like this? Is it, 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 it the decision, do I pick this eyeliner or that eyeliner? This makeup shade or this, that makeup? Ashley will bring me two different lip glosses or something and she'll hold them up. She's like, which one's better? I'm like, babe, they're both pink. I don't. <laughs> it's not like any of those decisions because when we see him for who he truly, truly is, it's the easiest decision to make. When we have our eyes fixed on him, when we see him in the light of who really is, the choice is so easy yet so complicated to make because that decision echoes into every other decision I make in my entire life for the rest of my life. A.W. Tozer said this, he says, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. It's the most important thing about us. So what we think about the Lord, how you perceive him to be, determines how we respond to him. I wanna read this. This is who he is. It's in Colossians 1, 15. It says, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. And I'm gonna keep reading, but you can shout anytime you want to during this whole thing, okay? So if something just hits you, just let it out, okay? 
For through him, God created everything in, in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, authorities, and the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else and he holds all creation together. That's who we serve. That's who we seek first. That's who we're after. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning supreme over all who rise from the dead. He is first in everything. For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ and through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. This includes you who were once far away from God. We were once enemies separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions, yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. As a result, he has brought you into his own presence and you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. That is who we serve. That is who we seek after. That's the one thing that I'm after. I'm not after anything less than him. That version of him who created all things, who's in all things. How could I not seek anything else but him? That's an easy decision in light of who he is. But we have to do is we have to remind ourselves of who he is. That's why we have his word. But what happens when we don't? Well, I'm glad you asked. In Romans chapter one, Verse 19, it says, they know the truth about God because he has made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky through everything God made. They can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. Can I just tell you, if you have a trouble figuring out if, if God's real or, or, or is he really, did he do really everything that he says he did? Just go out and look at a mountain. Go out and look at the ocean. Go, go oh, and stare at the sky. Grab you a telescope and look at the stars. Can I tell you that he is a great, big and powerful God and I am so not. I'm kind of after something today. Can, 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 just put your phone down and go outside for like an hour and just look around and just look at the intentionality of everything in nature, everything that's been created. Look at every little part from, from, from a butterfly to an ant to, to, to a deer in the woods, to a lake, to the ocean and everything in between. Can I tell you that that's such an incredible miracle that all of it works in harmony and it's so wondrous. I think sometimes we take for granted the fact that we're where we are. We're very comfortable. Where was I? Verse 22. Wait, no, 21. Yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. And this is what happens when we don't. And they begin to think up foolish ideas about of what God was like. As a result, their minds became dark and confused. Claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools. And instead of worshiping the glorious, ever-living God, they worshiped idols made to look like mere people, birds, animals, and reptiles. You see, when we refuse to put God first and worship him for who he truly is, we are so created to be in relationship and we're so created to worship that we'll find anything else to worship. You see that in, in Exodus, Moses goes up to the mountain and then they get amnesia or something and he comes back and you, they're worshiping a golden calf and he, he wouldn't even go on that long. We're all created to worship. So, so what happens is when we don't acknowledge God and we refuse to thank him, we start creating idols out of things that steal our gaze, that steal our attention from, other, from him. You see, everything has to come into alignment under him. 
Jesus said this in Matthew 16. I'm gonna skip to verse 25. It says, if you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? We've got, if we wanna try and find out who we really are and who we were really created to be, we've gotta find it in him. It's not gonna come from a career. It's not gonna come from the praise of other people. It's not gonna come from the affirmation of your spouse or your friends. It's only gonna come from him. And until we acknowledge that, we're just gonna be hollow echoes or caricatures of wh- who we think people who should, ought to, we, we ought to be. And we'll always fall short, but we need him. See, putting him first is not just a one-time decision. If you need to make that decision, I pray that you do because it is the most adventurous decision you'll ever make. But it's a constant, constant decision to include him in every aspect of your life. Everything must come into alignment under his order when we seek him first. There's a testimony of a, of a business owner who here at our church, who he started a lawn care business and he came to Pastor Daniel. I don't even know if I'm supposed to share this, but I'm not gonna say any names, so it doesn't matter. He asked Pastor Daniel if there was a, a widow that he could mow their grass for because as their business, they wanted to be a blessing to other people. And so um, Daniel gives him the, the address of a, a widow who needed her grass cut and they began to cut her grass and then he was just starting out his business and that widow that needed her grass cut moved into an assisted living place or not assisted, or independent living home with other people in a whole complex, apartment complex. And her grass wasn't getting cut there. And so she called this member of our church and he came and asked if he could help out or whatever. And then eventually his business ended up getting the contract to mow that entire complex that that widow lived in. And then he started getting other contracts for other living places all around the upstate. And now from sowing the seed of putting God first in his business, he's now got accounts mowing the lawn for multiple properties all over the upstate because he was willing to make the sacrifice to put God first and serve a widow. Isn't that miraculous? How, how, how when you put God first, everything else comes into alignment with our business. I'm gonna hit on a couple things that I believe is the, one of some of the most important things we can put God first in, in seeking him. First is our family life. In our devotional life with our family, I believe it's the most important thing is what's gonna hold your family together. I remember, and I'll talk about my mom a lot today, but I remember my mom would always wake, up, wake us up on Saturday morning, either playing the piano or cleaning the house, listening to the, the Brownsville Revival CD with Lyndall Cooley. And so like I'd wake up on a Saturday morning and expect to like watch some cartoons or something and she's cleaning the house, listening to, I went to the enemy's camp and I'm like, my mom, it's Saturday. It was frustrating back then, but I, I so value it now because she kept God first. And she, she let us experience that. She let us be a part of that. In your family life, you know you can minister together as a family. You can serve as a family. There are multiple families in here from uh, multiple generations that serve together. If you, any Sunday morning, you can find a, a, a mom and their kids serving on Sunday morning as a greeter or multiple places, but ministry isn't just something you get to do when you're old enough. It's something that everyone can engage in today. And you've gotta see your life and see your family as a family that ministers together. We've gotta make God first in our time. I wanna challenge you, don't do it now, but when you get home or later, go into your phone, hit the settings button, and then go to screen time. Oh, it's scary. Some of you probably got the alert like earlier this morning of how much time you spent on your phone this week. 
Go to screen time and look how much time you're spending on your phone every day. The average American spends seven hours a day on their phone. Not, not teenagers. Don't be like, well, that's just teenagers running up the, that's adults. That's you, it's me. That's, that's a lot of Pinterest, ladies, I'm going to be honest. Seven hours. And what, what the crazy part is, we all, we all know this. We don't just find time. We have to make it. We've got to be intentional about some things. And so one thing we can do is just put our phone down. Or just limit it. Put some guardrails on it. If you know you're spending too much time on your phone, there's a way on your phone where you can limit how much time you spend on individual apps. I know you're getting really quiet, and I don't care because it's worth it, okay? It's worth it to set those boundaries. It's worth it to, to give up mindless scrolling that produces depression and loneliness. And it makes you feel ungrateful <laughs> and bitter. You're watching all these people have all these different... If I look at another blogger who's got their job, is just to take pictures and travel... I'm going to throw up. It's just like, they're like, hey, I want to thank my sponsor. I'm like, shut up. (laughs) I buy that energy drink. I'm paying for your YouTube video. But our time is what we can handle. We can manage it. We can honor the Lord and seek him first in our career. Does our job align with our devotion to the Lord and our priorities. In our social life, community is so vital. Did you know that statistics show that this is the most connected generation that's ever walked the earth, but yet they're the loneliest? All that screen time and all that social networking has led to loneliness and depression. But there's an answer for that. It's called community, genuine community. Psalm 68 verse 6 says that God puts the lonely in families. In your physical and mental health, we should be putting God first. In our entertainment and hobbies, I can get caught up with this because I have a lot of hobbies, mainly because we haven't, I don't have kids yet. I'm, we're expecting one. Um, but she's not here yet. And so I've enjoyed the last 13 years of marriage, basically just enjoying my sleep. And, <laughs> and I tell people, uh, oh, we slept long enough. It's fine. I got it saved up. <laughs> Let's see. But honestly, I, I, I'll be honest with you, sometimes with things that I kind of get interested in, I kind of go all in, head first. And I, I, I start watching YouTube videos and researching and I get so far deep into it that I almost create an idol of it to where like I, my attention is so wrapped up in this one thing that I ignore multiple other things. Am I the only one that does that or is it just me? Okay, it's just me, wow, okay. But we can build idols out of our hobbies and the things we enjoy to do. And I'm not saying those things are bad. It's just they've got to be in the right alignment, in the right order. We've got to put the Lord first in our church life. Get planted in a local church. If this is your church home, congratulations. If not, find one. You've got to get planted. Because planted plants produce fruit. And they grow down, they grow roots. If you're not planted, your growth is going to be stunted. It's just the way it is. You're going to be limited on your nourishment, your resources, just like a plant that's not planted in the soil. I truly believe that those are just some of the ways that we can put the Lord first. And I'm not trying to put any, anything on you that I'm not put, I've already, haven't already put on myself, honestly. I, with us expecting our first kid, I'm... I'm terrified, honestly. Um, And I'm checking these things off in my life now because I 
I want to do it right. And there's, there's, there's going to be an opportunity for me to mess up a lot. And the Lord gives us grace. But I, I want to set a better example for, for my daughter than I had when I was growing up. And so with all that, can I just tell you that the struggle is real? It is, and it's okay. There's people in the Bible who struggled with keeping the Lord first. In Psalm 73, there's this guy named Asaph who wrote Psalm 73. Asaph was a chief musician in the house of the Lord. So he was a, I'll just say he was the, he was the top guitar player in the tabernacle of David. I don't know if he was really, tell, whatever, it doesn't matter. Uh, he did something. He might have been the choir director. But he's one of the three chief musicians, and so his job was to train up all the other musicians in the tabernacle of David. So he was in there all the time working. He was always there, always in the presence of God, always seeking God with other people, and he was just in it, just seeking God every day, 24-7. And he has this, this dialogue, and I don't know how this, this psalm made it into the book of Psalms because he's very candid, he's very honest, and he even says, if I'd have told anybody this, they would have thought I was crazy, but apparently he told somebody because it's in the Bible. So um, if you turn in Psalm 73, I'm not going to read all of this. I know it's on the screen, but I'm going to start with verse 1. It says, Truly God is good to Israel, to those whose hearts are pure. But as for me, I almost lost my footing. My feet were slipping and I was almost gone, for I envied the proud when I saw them prosper. Despite their wickedness, they seem to live such painless lives, and their bodies are so healthy and strong. You see, the key word is seem. They seem to live such painless lives. They don't have any troubles like other people. They're not plagued with problems like everyone else. They wear their pride like a jeweled necklace, clothe themselves with cruelty. These fat cats have everything their hearts could ever wish for. They scoff and speak only evil in their pride. They seek to crush others. They boast against the very heavens. Their words strut throughout the earth. And so people are dismayed and confused, drinking in all their words. What does God know, they ask? What does the Most High even know what's happening? Look at these wicked people enjoying a life of ease while their riches multiply. And when you put the Lord first, this is the kind of things that you're gonna have to struggle with. You're gonna have to look around and say, how come Elon Musk is naming his kids with mixed up Scrabble tiles and letters? He's, he's naming his kids after algebra problems and I can't, me and my wife, we struggled for years to have a kid. How come Nick Cannon has 15 kids and we can't even have one? These are the things that go through my mind. We look at all this wickedness and say, well, they're, they're, they're not struggling. They're not, what's, what, what's, what's going on there? And then Asaph says this, he says in verse 13, did I keep my heart pure for nothing? Did I keep myself innocent for no reason? And you're gonna ask yourself, Lord, is seeking God really worth it? Is the financial struggle I'm in really worth it? When I chose a, 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 this career over that one, when, when I chose a career that wouldn't get to interfere with my family time? When I took this job instead of that job, when I chose to live here instead of there, these thoughts go through your mind when, when things happen, when you start looking around. He said, I get nothing but trouble all day long. Every morning brings me pain. If I had really spoken this way to others, see, it's right there. I would have been a traitor to your people. So I tried to understand why the wicked prosper, but what a difficult task it is. So he tried to figure it out all while he's like, did I, did, I, did I set myself apart for you for nothing? And there's gonna be days when we feel like that. 
There's gonna be days when you open up your Bible in the morning and don't feel anything. You think a lot of people get me and Ashley confused because we, they think we just go home and sing worship songs to each other all day long. And <laughs> you guys must must have great devotional lives. Y'all just lead worship all day. I don't go home and just play guitar all day. I wake up in the morning just like everybody else. And there are some days where I just wanna stay in bed and not get out of bed and not open my Bible and not seek him and not choose to put him first. Sometimes I pitch a fit and I'm like, Lord, I'm not doing it. I'm going back to bed. But this is where his tone changed. Verse 17 says this, it says, then when I went into your sanctuary, O God, and I finally understood the destiny of the wicked. He said, then when I went into your sanctuary, O God, I finally understood the destiny of the wicked. Say, he took his eyes off of the Lord and put them on everything else that was happening. He put them on the economy. He put it on Hollywood. He put it on politics. His attention was on so many different things. And then when he went into the presence of God, everything changed. His perspective got realigned. His, his gaze got re, refastened to, to be on, being only on the Lord. And his perspective is what, what shifts here. It says, then I went into your sanctuary. In verse 18, it says, truly you put them on a slippery path and send them sliding over the cliff into destruction. In an instant, they are destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. When you arise, O Lord, you will laugh at their silly ideas as a person who laughs at dreams in the morning. Then I realized my heart was bitter and I was all torn up inside. I was so foolish and ignorant, I must have seemed like a senseless animal to you, yet I still belong to you. You hold my right hand. And I'm so glad this is in here because sometimes you look at, you read things and you're just like, you know, David was such a, a man after God's own heart. Oh, I wanna be like, John the Baptist who just was a voice in the wilderness and was just a homeless guy in the woods, but everybody came out to hear him preach. And you get guys like Asaph who are just like, man, I was, I was bitter. My heart wasn't in the right place. And and this is, what, this is where we end up being a lot of times. In verse 25, it says this. Whom have I in heaven but you? I desire you more than anything on earth. My health may fail and my spirit may grow weak, but God remains the strength of my heart. He is mine forever. That's where we've got to land. From the decision to seeking him first and putting him above all else in my family and my career and my finances and my time and my energy and my focus, my hobbies, all of those things. And then everything still doesn't work out. I've got to put my faith in God, and believe that he's still got a plan. He still loves me. I haven't moved outside of his will or, or, his, or his love. And though I might be struggling for a second because maybe I took my eyes off of, of him for a second, I'm gonna get back into his presence and realign my, my gaze with his, realign my life, realign my focus. Though my health may fail and my spirit may grow weak, but God remains the strength of my heart. He is mine forever. And so I really wanna see God move. I really wanna see him move in the upstate. I really wanna see him move here in our church. And I believe he's going to, but he's, he's gonna he's going to come where he's wanted. I 
So I want to pray for three different kind of people this morning. If you're seeking the Lord, and I know there's a lot of people in here who have been seeking the Lord for decades, longer than I've been alive. And I want to say thank you for seeking the Lord and being faithful and prioritizing him. There are sons and daughters in this church who are running on roads that you paved the way for. And I want to say thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your, your, your perspective, for your vision. Thank you for your hungry. Thank you, thank you for your willingness to keep pressing in and keep going after the Lord. I wanna pray for you because I want you to keep seeking him. Keep praying for revival. Keep praying for awakening. Keep praying that God would pour out his spirit. Keep pressing in that he would continue to stoke that fire in your heart. Then I wanna pray for people who are honestly just struggling. You're like Asaph and you're, you get discouraged a lot. You get distracted a lot. And that's okay. Because I believe just like Asaph, when you lift your eyes and match your gaze with his, you come into alignment with seeking him with your whole heart. Everything else he'll add. And then I wanna pray for those who need to put him first. You heard me talking and you're probably like, yeah, I probably need to put him first. I've got some things that are out of order. I've got some things that are out of alignment. So let's all stand this morning. I wanna pray for you, but I just wanna call the ministry team down. You can come. I'm not gonna have everybody come down to the front. I don't think I'm preaching that good enough for you guys to come down. But what I do know, do know that some of us do need prayer. We do need someone to stand alongside of us. We do need somebody to come alongside of us and agree. You know, there's been several times where I've had to come down here and <laughs> shed a tear or two on somebody's shoulder. So let's pray. Lord, I thank you for everyone here. I thank you for those who have been seeking the Lord, who have been faithful, who are hungry, who have been praying for revival, Lord, I pray that you just satisfy that hunger, satisfy that need, satisfy that groan in their heart, Lord. Lord, I wanna pray for those who, who are just struggling. They feel like they're just fighting every day. Like Asaph, they feel discouraged, they feel disappointed some days. They feel like, Lord, have I, have I chosen, have I made the wrong decision? You're second guessing yourself. Lord, I just ask you to give them grace to continually choose you above all else. God, give them the grace to seek you every day, Jesus. And Lord, I just pray for those who need to put him first. Those who have been wondering why things just aren't working right. You're trying to do it on your own. You're trying to fix it yourself. You're trying to do everything in your own strength. Can I just tell you this morning to just let go? You weren't created to do this by yourself. You need him. 
You need to pick him. You need to choose to put him first in your life and in your heart. So this morning, I just thank you, Lord, for your people, Lord, and I just ask you that you would just give them the grace, give us the grace, give me the strength, Lord, to seek you first every day, Lord. That you would be our one thing, that you would be our one singular focus, Lord. And everything else would fall into place and fall into alignment, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. I love you guys. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. If you need prayer, the prayer team's up here. And I pray you have a great rest of your day.